Eight. Pink lights and champagne. Bond walked up to his room, which again showed no sign of trespass, threw off his clothes, took a long hot bath followed by an ice cold shower, and lay down on his bed. There remained an hour in which to rest and compose his thoughts before he met the girl in the splendid bar, an hour to examine minutely the details of his plans for the game and for after the game in all the various circumstances of victory or defeat. He had to plan the attendant roles of Matisse, Leiter, and the girl and visualize the reactions of the enemy in various contingencies. He closed his eyes and his thoughts pursued his imagination through a series of carefully constructed scenes as if he was watching the tumbling chips of colored glass in a kaleidoscope. At twenty minutes to nine, he had exhausted all the permutations which might result from his duel with the chief. He rose and dressed, dismissing the future completely from his mind. As he tied his thin, double-ended black satin tie, he paused for a moment and examined himself levelly in the mirror. His grey-blue eyes looked calmly back with a hint of ironical inquiry, and the short block of black hair which would never stay in place slowly subsided to form a thick comma above his right eyebrow. With a thin vertical scar down his right cheek, the general effect was faintly piratical. Not much of Hoagie Carmichael there, thought Bond, as he filled a flat, light gunmetal box with fifty of the Moreland cigarettes with the triple gold band. Matthias had told him of the girl's comment. He slipped the case into his hip pocket and snapped his oxidized Ronson to see if it needed fuel. After pocketing the sheaf of ten mil notes, he opened a drawer and took out a light chamois leather holster and slipped it over his left shoulder so that it hung about three inches below his armpit. He then took from under his shirts in another drawer a very flat twenty-five Beretta automatic with a skeleton grip, extracted the clip and the single round in the barrel, and whipped the action to and fro several times, finally pulling the trigger on the empty chamber. He charged the weapon again, loaded it, put up the safety catch, and dropped it into the shallow pouch of the shoulder holster. He looked carefully around the room to see if anything had been forgotten, and slipped his single-breasted dinner jacket coat over his heavy silk evening shirt. He felt cool and comfortable. He verified in the mirror that there was absolutely no sign of the flat gun under his left arm, gave a final pull at his narrow tie, and walked out the door and locked it. When he turned at the foot of the short stairs towards the bar, he heard the lift door open behind him and a cool voice call, Good evening. It was the girl. She stood and waited for him to come up to her. He had remembered her beauty exactly. He was not surprised to be thrilled by it again. Her dress was of black velvet, simple and yet with the touch of splendor that only a half a dozen coutures in the world can achieve. There was a thin neckline of diamonds at her throat, and a diamond clip in the low V which just exposed the jutting swell of her breasts. She carried a plain black evening bag, a flat object which she now held, her arm akimbo at her waist. Her jet black hair hung straight and simple to the final inward curl below the chin. She looked quite superb, and Bond's heart lifted. You look absolutely lovely. Business must be good in the radio world. She put her arm through his. Do you mind if we go straight into dinner? she asked. I want to make a grand entrance, and the truth is there's a horrible secret about black velvet. It marks when you sit down. And by the way, if you hear me scream tonight, I shall have sat on a cane chair. Bond laughed. Of course. Let's go straight in. We'll have a glass of vodka while we order our dinner. She gave him an amused glance, and he corrected himself. Or a cocktail, of course, if you prefer it. The food here is the best in Royale. For an instant he felt nettled at the irony, the light shadow of a snub with which she had met his decisiveness, and at the way he had risen to her quick glance. But it was only an infinitesimal clink of foils, and as the bowing maitre d'hôtel led them through the crowded room, it was forgotten as Bond in her wake watched the heads of the diners turn to look at her. The fashionable part of the restaurant was beside the wide crescent of window built out like the broad stern of a ship over the hotel gardens, but Bond had chosen a table in one of the mirrored alcoves at the back of the great room. These had survived from the Edwardian days, and they were secluded and gay in white and gilt, with the red silk-shaded table and wall lights of the late empire. As they deciphered the maze of purple ink which covered the double folio menu, Bond beckoned to the sommelier. He turned to his companion. Have you decided? I would love a glass of vodka, she said simply, and went back to her study of the menu. A small carafe of vodka, very cold, ordered Bond. He said to her abruptly, I can't drink to the health of your new frock without knowing your Christian name. Vesper, she said. Vesper Lind. Bond gave her a look of inquiry. It's rather a bore always having to explain, but I was born in the evening, on a very stormy evening according to my parents. Apparently they wanted to remember it. She smiled. Some people like it, others don't. I'm just used to it. I think it's a fine name, said Bond. An idea struck him. Can I borrow it? He explained about the special martini he had invented and his search for a name for it. The Vesper, he said. It sounds perfect, and it's very appropriate to the violet hour when my cocktail will now be drunk all over the world. Can I have it? So long as I can try one first, she promised. It sounds like a drink to be proud of. We'll have one together when all this is finished, said Bond. Win or lose. And now, have you decided what you would like to have for dinner? Please be expensive, he added, as he sensed her hesitation, or you'll let down that beautiful frock. I'd made two choices, she laughed, and either would have been delicious, but behaving like a millionaire occasionally is a wonderful treat, and if you're sure, well, I'd like to start with caviar, and then have a plain grilled rognon de veau with pomme souffle, and then I'd like to have fraise de bois with a lot of cream. Is it very shameless to be so certain and so expensive? She smiled at him inquiringly. It's a virtue, and anyway, it's only a good, plain, wholesome meal, he turned to the maitre d'hôtel, and bring plenty of toast. 
The trouble always is, he explained to Vesper, not how to get enough caviar, but how to get enough toast with it. Now, he turned back to the menu, I myself will accompany Mademoiselle with the caviar, but then I would like a very small tourne d'eau, underdone, with sauce béronnaise and a cour d'artichaut. While Mademoiselle is enjoying the strawberries, I will have half an avocado pear with a little French dressing. Do you approve? The maître d'hôtel bowed. My compliments, Mademoiselle et Monsieur. Monsieur Georges? He turned to the sommelier and repeated the two dinners for his benefit. Parfait, said the sommelier, proffering the leather-bound wine list. If you agree, said Bond, I would prefer to drink champagne with you tonight. It is a cheerful wine, and it suits the occasion, I hope, he added. Yes, I would like champagne, she said. With his finger on the page, Bond turned to the sommelier. The Tatanger 45? A fine wine, monsieur, said the sommelier. But if monsieur will permit, he pointed with a pencil, the Blanc de Blanc Brou 1943 of the same mark is without equal. Bond smiled. So be it, he said. That is not a well-known brand, Bond explained to his companion, but it is probably the finest champagne in the world. He grinned suddenly at the touch of pretension in his remark. You must forgive me, he said. I take ridiculous pleasure in what I eat and drink. It comes partly from being a bachelor, but mostly from a habit of taking a lot of trouble over details. It's very pernickety and old maidish, really. But then when I'm working, I generally have to eat my meals alone, and it makes them more interesting when one takes the trouble. Vesper smiled at him. I like it, she said. I like doing everything fully, getting the most out of everything one does. I think that's the way to live. But it sounds rather schoolgirlish when one says it, she added apologetically. The little carafe of vodka had arrived in its bowl of crushed ice, and Bond filled their glasses. Well, I agree with you anyway, he said. And now, here's luck for tonight, Vesper. Yes, said the girl quietly, as she held up her small glass and looked at him with a curious directness straight in the eyes. I hope all will go well tonight. She seemed to Bond to give a quick involuntary shrug of the shoulders as she spoke, but then she leant impulsively towards him. I have some news for you from Matisse. He was longing to tell you himself. It's about the bomb. It's a fantastic story.